Welcome, everybody, to another episode of the Leah Purpose Podcast. Listen, I'm your host, John Morgan Jr., and we have, um, as you can see, we have a, a panel here. We have a special group of collective um, brothers here with us today, man. To my left, we have Pastor Lorenzo Neal. To my right, Pastor Jeffrey Dennis. To the far right, we have Dr. John Queener. Um, listen, we are front and center here in the city of um, Akron, Ohio, our hometown. Um, and I wanted to just bring you guys together specifically to kind of just Talk a little bit about, you know, what's currently taking place here um, after the events, the uh, unfortunate tragedy, um, the killing of, 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 of Jalen. Um, first and foremost, I want to start with you, pa Pastor Dennis. Um, but I want this to be a question for all of you. How are you feeling? How was your energy? How was your spirit? Um, how, how's your mind during, during this time? You guys are leaders. But how are you? How are you, you know, genuinely feeling? Oh, John, that's a good question. Because let me tell you what I, what I have done the past two nights. My prayer the past two nights have been, God, let me just have a good night's rest. Hmm. <laughs> just because of um, carrying the weight of all of this and trying to be at so many different things that are going on, um, I can only imagine what the family feels. Um, I can't begin to describe it. Only they know how how they feel and um but i know the weight and the pressure that that i uh, have been experiencing um, trying to help people to <clears throat> find ways to express um how 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 they feel and where they are um and when i say people not just parishioners but people who are leading in our community i've been checking with some of them and talking with them talking with folks in law enforcement and seeing how they feel and even praying with them. So just carrying the weight of that, um, and a lot of us as religious leaders, we do that. We feel the weight of not only our parishioners, but the weight of the community. So I've been praying, and here's the great thing about it. God answers prayer. I got a good night's sleep. So. <laughs> good. <laughs> I feel better. Good. Pastor Glenn, how, how are you? How, how is your spirit? How, how's your energy? How, how are you? How are you handling all of this? Well, needless to say, it's been overwhelming uh, because it's so ongoing. I mean, there, in Jalen's uh, service will be coming up on tomorrow, and um, that will that will start another engine after he's put the rest and the family has asked for peaceful protests. But everyone, including me, I, I want to see justice carried out. Um, it, it seems that there are so many uh, unanswered uh, uh, questions that that lead up to where this is, and it, it causes uh, a weight. It causes a weight because for so many people, it seems, again, like it should be a situation that's cut and dry. Um, what's, what's to talk about? You know, a young man killed the way he was, unarmed, uh, not a threat. He was... Uh, more of a threat when they were up on the car, but once he ran away, the, the, the threat decreased, but yet they felt they could shoot. And I, the average, I mean, uh, I got an eight-year-old granddaughter, and she can reason to say, why was that necessary? So that heightens uh, the anticipation for justice to be served. Yeah, absolutely. What about you, Dr. John? How, how are you? How are you coping and, 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 and dealing with all of this? Yeah, my mood changes over time. Uh, initially, I was feeling very angry, um, telling myself, well, here we go again, another unarmed black man being shot by the police. Um, then it moved into feeling some sadness and empathizing with the family. Um, I don't know how I would feel if one of my sons were killed by the police, but I don't think it would be something that would be easy for me to manage. So I send my prayers out to the family, to the Walker family, that they find strength 
and comfort and strength from God as they go through this ordeal. Um, the other thing I find that's helpful for me uh, in dealing with these racial traumas, which is a consistent thing that black folks have to deal with, is to be active, is to do something, to talk to people, not to repress my feelings, but to actually go out and to be active. And so I feel that when I use that energy to try to build on something, or use that energy to make things better, then that's a good, useful way to get rid of some of the energy I have that comes from the anger that I feel. Beautiful. Listen, one of the one of the reasons why I feel like right now is just so divine, right? Is because for me, Granny always told me in the in the in the face of turmoil, in the face of stress, you do two things. You take it up with God, and the next thing you do is you always check in with your elders, right? And so for having you gentlemen here with me today. I've, I've talked to you about this, Pastor Dennis. For me, I have to lean on my faith in, in, in moments like this. But also, like you said, Doc, Dr. John, the emotions that, that come with this, the roller coaster of your emotions that come with this, it is overwhelming, as, as you said, you know, um, pa Pastor Glenn. So when I hear all of this, especially being, being a young person, being a man with two young children, I can only imagine what the what the families are, are, are dealing with. So as you guys just, when you look at your own families, you know, you are men first. You know, your fathers, fathers first, grandfathers. How are you guys reckoning and reasoning with the injustice that is taking place and right here in, in, in our city? It has uh, really become... Um, quite a Goliath. Um, it, is, it stands up like a nine foot, nine inch giant in relationship to where every day, like uh, Goliath did, he showed up and oppressed and antagonized the people. And this thing has been showing up this last shooting with Jalen, it's every day. It's every day. You almost feel convicted if you pay attention to something else more or something that you might have to read. Because as pastors, as clinicians and doctors, we want to stay abreast with what's going on in the community and, and uh this giant, um, every morning we make up, he's in the middle of the city, and he hasn't been uh, defeated yet. Mm -hmm. And um, that makes it ongoing. Yeah. Dr. John, you said something earlier. Um, you said that one of the first things that you do in moments like these is you accept the type of system that we have, right? Um, in the historical context, speaking to the oppressive system that this is. Can you just kind of expound on what you mean by that? Yeah, one of the things I, I recommend that people do is they understand history. And then once you understand history, you can understand the context in which things exist. Nothing happens out of the vacuum. Things evolve a particular way. And so one of the things that has happened since black men has been brought to this country and changed, we've always been targeted. So Jalen is just a continuation of the genocide that's been committed against black men. So when you understand that kind of context and when you understand that history, then you're never really caught off guard. And in fact, even before Jalen happened, I was always anxious when my sons, my three sons in age, between the ages of 21 and 30, I'm always concerned when they're driving around, always concerned when they're out at night because I don't know when a simple violation will turn into a murder scene or turn into racial trauma. So it's something that I live with. And it's interesting because I reflect back when I was their age, and my mother was always concerned when I would go somewhere. She would always say, well, be careful. Watch out. You don't have to do anything wrong. You can just be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Mm -hmm. So it's a fear, I think, that parents commonly have to cope with uh, with their children, especially since we know from history uh, black men have been targeted by the system. And so that is something that has unfortunately become a norm for me. 
Dr. John, being a being a psychologist, right? Um, and me me personally, I have not. I've I've chosen not to watch the video, right? You know, I, I understand that for me, it it will trigger me, and you know, I I choose to to stay away from what that would do to to me. But we know that we are in a social media society, a multimedia society, where unfortunately we are able to see these you know these brutalities happen on camera over and over and over. Um, can you kind of just talk on and touch on a little bit about like what that may do to a person psychologically to kind of take on that type of energy and see, seeing trauma happen like that on, on camera? Yeah, it's what we call racial trauma and it usually have what we call post-traumatic stress type symptoms. And again, you don't have to go through something yourself. You can experience it vicariously. So if you think you're going to be traumatized by looking at the video, then I strongly recommend that you not look at it. But if you have looked at it and you do have some symptoms related to uh, negative thoughts like depression, anger, anxiety, grief, or you have intrusive memories, or you want to isolate yourself, that you try to talk to someone. The best thing we know when you're dealing with trauma is not to repress the memories, but actually talk about your feelings, talk about your memories, get it all out, and try to deal with it in a constructive manner, as opposed to allowing it to internalize inside of you what affects you emotionally, psychologically, and physically. So my recommendation is if you know it's something that's gonna trigger you, don't look at it, but if you did look at it and it did trigger you, make sure you find a supportive environment where you can talk to people, get it out, and not keep it internalized inside. Yeah. Pastor Dennis, one of the things that you said is that you wanna see happen is you wanna see transparency um, in the investigation. Can you just kind of touch on a, what that looks like? What does transparency in this situation look like? Yeah, I think that transparency um, takes on a number of different looks, uh, primarily as it relates to this situation in the police department. Um, we want to see all of the, um, the police cams. Show, show us all of them. Let us hear everything that was said from beginning to end. Let's lay out all of the evidence um, let's take a good look and a deep look at how officers view people in the urban community and primarily African Americans and specifically African American men. Um, Pastor Glenn spoke earlier, John, about, um, you know, about uh, how there is a difference, and I'm sure he can come back and, and share that as well, but we need to have a really good conversation and really be uh, transparent about how we are viewed, and also the internal systems that are in place. Um, and, and are they there for justice, or are these systems in place to just protect the system? Mm. Yeah. Can you expound, expound on that, Pastor Glenn? Well, yes, because um, we, we see the inconsistency of uh, policing, um, the stereotypes and the profiling has always uh, been, you know, clearly visible. Um, this situation, again, um, I, I contrast uh, the situation where um, one person is running and they're captured while we can't run out. An individual law enforcement officer said, well, Pastor Glenn, uh, you can't run. I said, we can't run. Mm -hmm. um, African American men can't run. Because when we used um, Illinois, that, gen that gentleman ran. He ran, he was premeditated, disguised himself as in women's clothing and ran in the crowd to get away and they caught up with him and, and, and handcuffed him and took him away unscathed, you know. And when you contrast that with Jalen, he's, he's unarmed. This fellow in you know, Illinois killed eight people in an right. affluent neighborhood. Right. He, he he'd already murdered at least seven people and mm -hmm. injured countless. And, and they run and catch up with him, 
And then you contrast that with Jalen. He's stopped for a traffic violation or attempted to be stopped, and they, he goes on a chase, and he gets out of the car and runs away from him unarmed. And they shoot him 60 times. That's not close to anything. There, right. There's no marginal. That, that's just day and night, you know. And uh, you can't get the average uh, citizen in the African American culture to to see any different that that was just injustice, right. pure that injustice. Right. Mm -hmm. right. What, what, what if that would have been a dog? Right? Yeah, yeah. And and we shared that if if there if it was an animal, especially a dog, and they shot a dog sixty times. They are there are animal That's activists, right. humane That's right. activists That's right. that would, all over the nation. Either came, animal, animal, animal came, cruelty people would have been would've on the came front line. In here, right. You didn't have That's to right. shoot that dog right. 60 times. Right. And this was a human being, a black man. There would have been a tremendous uh, uh, uprover for the dog. Well, that's, a, that's the thing, right? That's the part that, that is the part that becomes um, that can create anger and it can also make it, you know, overwhelming. The confusion of it all is because regardless of what may be surrounding Jalen, no, ma no matter what, there is there is no reason to justify the being shot 60 times. You know, under no circumstance, it doesn't matter what he was doing, what time, what he did the night before, what he had on, what there is nothing that justifies that type of outcome. So any way you slice it, you know, it is un unjust. Right, you know what I'm saying. So that's the that's the part that becomes frustrating. I went through a, a, a simulator as a chaplain for the Akron Police Department under another chief, and generally with the simulator, that's one officer with one individual that could be very well a suspect, and and he's going. You know, you're not you're not talking about eight officers, but one officer. I'm 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 it's the. Uh, voice commanded uh, simulator. And I have to make a decision whether to shoot or not to shoot on, on one suspect, and it's just me. Now you have eight officers, and they all see it the same way. No one, no one seen it any differently, where if it was the different scenario, why not? You know, run him down. Right. He'll stop. Why Just all chase him. Why, yeah. why is everybody shooting? Why, why not? Why not? See, and the problem is, when it comes to us, they lack de-escalating procedure. Mm -hmm. There's nothing said to de-escalate. It's just, you know, unhinged. Mm -hmm. Right. We saw the, the raw footage, John, and mm -hmm. the language that was used and just all of that was, um, we didn't see any de-escalation in that. And e even when I look at the situation that happened with Jalen and others, it's, it's, it's strange. I don't know about you all, but I actually have a concern when I'm driving as a black man. Mm -hmm. It's tough to be a black man in America. I actually take my license out uh, so I don't have to reach in my pocket. I put it out when I'm driving sometimes on the on the dashboard or something like that because of just my concern of moving the wrong way and right. how it's perceived. And I'm a supporter of law enforcement. Right. I have law enforcement in, in our church and in, in, in our community. Um, but even being a supporter of law enforcement, there's still the the concern as a black man as to what what will happen again if my movements are perceived by those who are stopping me okay. to be aggressive and, and, and all of that. And I don't know how to get around that. And those are the intricate details that make our experiences as black people and as black men just completely different than white folks. Those are those are small things that are just completely different that we have to consider. Man, that's so true. I was talking <laughs> with a white pastor who was a friend and who, uh, even during this uh, situation, reached out to me, let, it, let, him, let me know that he was praying for me and praying for the community. When I explained to him that I actually take my license out and um, how concerned I am about being stopped and what might happen, he could not understand. Couldn't understand it. it. 
Right. He, his first response was, well, are, are you doing anything wrong? <laughs> and, I was, and I tried to explain to him that it, we're not doing anything wrong. We're just driving. But there is this perception right. of who we are. Right. And, um, and it causes discomfort and fear in, in, in uh, so many African-American um, people in general. Right. But trying to get um, um, pastors, uh, white pastors and others to understand this, and I believe so many really do want to understand it, um, it's hard for them to relate to it because it's not their experience. Not their experience. Right. That, that um, hypervigilance that we all experience is a part of the racial trauma that we, we know about. And so even when we unconsciously don't think about it, that hypervigilance kicks in because it helps us cope. It helps us realize that we can actually survive the system. And so, again, it's something that we experience all the time. Um, I still get nervous when the police pull up behind me, and I have to tell myself, but I haven't done anything. <laughs> but then that's why we have high blood pressure and all this yeah. other stuff, because we're under a constant threat. Um, so, so I think it's real important for us to understand these situations and how these everyday situations affect us psychologically and emotionally. Man, how are y'all as community leaders, my pastors, how are y'all taking care of yourselves? Man, y'all have congregations y'all leading. Y'all got people, you got your own day-to-day -day responsibilities that you that you coming in, in contact with. People reaching out to you. You guys are on the front lines handling this, doing things like this, doing speaking engagements. But who do y'all go to in times like this? Like you got, again, man, you guys are men first. So how are you taking care of yourselves in the midst of, you know, all this ongoing trauma? Well, let me be transparent. <laughs> first of all, I've probably had... Um, one too many cookies, okay? <laughs> the sugar intake. I mean, yes. the, sugar, the, the eating, stress eating. You, you do those kind of <laughs> things, man, and I think it's kind of showing up in some areas. Mm. But, but other, than, other than that, John, I think one of the things I've become more comfortable with at this season of my life is when there are situations that trouble me and I need to cry, I've Ooh. told myself it's all right to cry. Mm. And I used to think that, and maybe you can help me out, Doc, okay? <laughs> I used to think that that was a lack of masculinity. Correct. But um, those tears are expressions that are so deep that I don't have words to express, yeah. Yeah. you know, for. So um, I, I, I feel comfortable doing that. But then at the same time, um, there's a greater appreciation for family. Uh, there's a greater appreciation for just seeing the grandkids, hugging the grandkids. Yeah, yeah. Of course, having a supportive wife like like my wife, uh, who has been there for me over, what almost 42 years now, um, is really helpful because she's there to talk with me about it. We we sit out on the deck, um, again walking, and you say, "Who do we have? We we have each other." And I think that in, in the, in, as it relates to clergy, um, just being able to talk together. And we've been having some support groups where we come together and just talk about right. how, we, how we feel. And then there's a part of us, when you talk about doing things for us, we feel the need to talk to those in power. Right. We have to talk to the chief. Mm -hmm. We want to talk to the mayor. We want to talk to other leaders because that gives us a sense of release as well, knowing that we've had the conversation and that there's going to be follow-up and follow-through on what the discussions were about. Right. What about you, Pastor Glenn? Um, well, the scriptures say iron sharpens iron, and uh, to be able to talk to other pastors, such as Pastor Dennis, because we always... He's brilliant when it comes to just looking deeper in the situation and he can bring out some things that I, I haven't really focused on yet so, and, and I can do vice versa for him with our different perspectives. But um, I, I share an um, illustration oftentimes and a message and I shared it with the police chief and, uh, and the uh, lieutenant when we had met. 
and I talked about a, uh, a little girl that got lost down south in a cornfield and temperature got up to about 90 degrees and, and she was out there for about two and a half hours lost you know, and it was hot and they were afraid of dehydration and they searched and searched and couldn't find her. They finally came to the conclusion, let's put a, let's make a human chain and comb it, you know, foot by foot. And it was 30 minutes and they found that baby, mm. but she had already died. Mm. And the mother was uh, on the ground with her rocking with her in her arms saying, if we, if we only could have come together sooner. Mm. And that's what I see here, that we need to come together soon. This thing needs to be resolved once and for all. Yeah. And uh, it takes everybody involved. Um, um, I was thankful to hear that uh, Pastor Dennis made mention that uh, one of his white pastor friends called and said he was praying because I believe everybody should be involved by now. You got two cultures involved. You got an African American black man uh, shot 60 times, and you got white police officers doing the shooting. So that includes, um, it shouldn't just be black pastors coming together, but right. white That's right. as well. That's and, right. And there's somewhat of a, a gap, disconnect. I mean, a, a disconnect that I, 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 I you know, we preach from the same Bible, so why not? Uh, and and for the lack of their presence, it could be interpreted that you know they see it justified. Possibly, it, you know, there's it's hard when there's no voice. So. But that's such a that's such an interesting point that you bring up. Like we always hear in in the communities in our conversations at home, just out and about, we always hear that the black church should be doing more. But we never hear the outcry about white pastors and white churches doing things, especially as it relates to things like this. This impacts us as a community as whole. And those churches, those congregations, those people in leadership are just as much as in power and should be held accountable just as much as you guys are. So as you speak on that, you know, how does that make y'all feel being black pastors and, and being leaders and, you know, having to depend on others, but th it should be something that's bringing holistic, us together. Holistic, two cultures is involved in this situation and it would, it would just be more palatable for, to see um, uh, the, the white clergy, our white brothers, you know, um, gathering with us in prayer and hoping for the best uh, outcome for the city. And, uh, for some reason, you know, there's a disconnect. You know, they're not, they're not, they're not there with us. And I, I've been around long. I've been in this city. I've been, I grew up here, and I'm 68 years old. And uh, it, it just seems like it should be holistic that we all come together, but. You don't see it. It is, it is disappointing, um, John, to um, not see overwhelming support as it relates to a number of issues that are um, present in the community. What I have found out in talking with a lot of white pastors and um, some others um, is this, that there are people who are concerned, and um, some of them really just don't know what to do. And um, I think that that is, uh, speaks to what Pastor Glenn was uh, sharing. I think there has to be the consistent effort on both communities to reach out and to learn from each other. Mm -hmm. um, and we can hopefully uh, share with each other things that need to be done. Prayer is important. We have to pray. And, and when you asked earlier, what do we do? Prayer and scripture are very important. And so when, when Pastor Glenn talks about um, praying together, that's important. But that's not the only thing that the church has ever done. The church should not just pray together. Mm. The church has to be present together. That's right. And together with one voice, do everything that it can through 
what we believe the scripture teaches us to make our community better places, our communities better places. And, um, and that involves standing up against oppression, systems of oppression, um, and uh, standing up for justice. The scripture says a whole lot about justice. Let's not just talk about love, but let's also um, exhibit the definition of what agape, what really, what real love is all about. Mm -hmm. it's, it's sacrificial. It's taking a stand. And then the other thing, John, and I know this is not the rabbit hole you want to go down, but I think that there needs to be um, a real serious examination of our theology and what has been taught historically uh, as relates to African Americans and um, who we are in Scripture. There's a lot of theology that has been taught historically that basically says black people are cursed, mm. that we are not made in the image of God, and a number of other things, and that all of the people in the Scripture were white. And um, uh, Jerome Gay talks about the whitewashing of Christianity. What we have to do is have that theological conversation and some of that false teaching that has been taught historically, all of it needs to be dealt with and corrected. Because many times it's because of our theological teachings mm -hmm. that people shape their views on how they view other yeah, people. That's right. That's a whole nother issue, John. <laughs> but um, I think that that's important. And I know that there are some that are open to having that conversation, but it's something that is necessary yeah. um, for healing in our community. Listen, last, last question for all three of you gentlemen. Um, Jalen's funeral is tomorrow. You know, you spoke about tact. You, talk, you spoke um, about the transparency. What, what do we want to see happen as a community for Jalen's family, you know, for our nation? You know what I'm saying? What do we want to see as black people? You know what I'm saying? What do we want to see happen in this case? So. Jayla's name is just not another name. The, the Tamir Rice's, your Laquan McDonald's, um, your Michael Brown's, um, Trayvon Martin's, just, just so he is not, a, not another name on that board. What needs to happen from, from our local law enforcement, law enforcement as a whole, um, specifically as it relates to this investigation, what needs to happen? John, you ought to take that because you have a historical piece. Go ahead, Dr. John. Break it down for us. Yeah, I, I don't know if I can fully answer your question in the amount of time we have. No, no, no. Well, give us but the... Let me try to give yeah, you the best Please version. Do. Um, one of the things I recommend everybody at the sound of my voice do is read the Kerner Report. The Kerner Report was written in 1968. Um, it was a commission, a bipartisan commission. Um, the LBJ at the time was the president wanted done to try to understand the race riots that were going on in all of our major cities, Detroit, uh, Los Angeles, Chicago, et cetera. And so what they said is that the race riots are just a symptom of a larger problem that we as a country need to deal with, and that's the inequality based on race. And so what the Kerner Report recommended is that we take a real good look at systemic racism that existed in our country. Now, that report was written in 1968, but if I were to pull it out today and talk about what was in that report, it could have easily been written when George Floyd was killed mm -hmm. by the police. Mm -hmm. It could easily have been written when Tamir Rice was killed. And so what I think needs to happen is we need to go back and look at that report and start implementing things that we said we were gonna implement when George Floyd was killed. I remember when he was killed, um, everybody and their mother was saying, oh, we need to do something about racial justice. Um, even NASCAR was saying, we need to do something <laughs> about racial justice. Yeah. Two years later, another black man has been killed, right. and what really has been done? Right. Now I don't wanna pick on the city of Akron, but I'm gonna go ahead and pick on it anyways. They had a commission after George Floyd, and they had a list of things that they were going to do. I don't know what happened to that, but I don't see anything well, being done different. The task force they established, some type of task force. I remember I was invited to be on. I never went to a meeting because I saw from the beginning it just 
it just, I don't know, they had some good ideas. Right. So what I don't want to have happen, you said what we do have happen, what I don't want is another report. We mm -hmm. got enough reports. What we need is actually action, people doing something differently than what they've done before. If you're going to do the same old thing you did the last time a black, unarmed black man was killed, then you're going to get the same results. The uh, definition of stupidity is to do the same thing over and over again and expect a different outcome. So my, my response is that we really need to look at systemic racism in education, systemic racism in um, banking, systemic edu uh, racism, and how we do our neighborhoods and sell houses. My daughter works for the FDIC, and she's saying they're finding reports where if you are black, your house can be worth $50,000, and you can only sell it for $30,000. And if you are white, the same neighborhood, and you are white, you sell that $50,000 house for $65,000. Now, those aren't her opinions. Those are not my opinions. Those are facts the government have. That here in 2022, we're still dealing with this stuff. And we try to act like because we had a black president, everything <laughs> should be fine now. Right, right. And so my recommendation is that the mayor's office on down, get the Kerner report out, look at its recommendations, and then start implementing the recommendations from the Kerner report. And therefore, maybe five years from now, 10 years from now, we can actually point to some successes that we've had to deal with the undercurrent systemic racism that leads to the type of killing that we're dealing with right now. Yeah. Um, I think that um, we, what we want to see happen, we want to continue um, praying for um, the Walker family. And we, they're, they're going to need community support, but they're going to really need the supernatural power of God yes. to help them through this situation. Right. Because it doesn't just stop after the service. It's going to continue on. There, there, there are investigations and just a number of things. So we want to continue to, to lift them up. And I, I know there's a number of things we can say, but I'll just say one. I, I ha had a chance to meet with the uh, chief of police and he mentioned that every officer that shot, they have to give an account for each time they shot. And with transparency, I would like to see the follow through on that and the follow up on that. And also those who are within the, the police academy and police um, structure, those who know things that are not right, things that are unjust, those who are part of the system from the inside out, I pray for their strength and courage to do what needs to be done to bring about change. I think they're also uh, to uh, continue where Pastor Dennis was is that there is uh, a problem with uh, policing as a whole for the FOP to say, you're going to find out after the BCI investigation that uh, the officers were justified in their shooting. Well, if there's something in their procedure to make that massacre correct, wow. then something really needs to be changed. Again, I still hold firmly the mindset that not one bullet should have been fired. Mm -hmm. The minute they shot one time at him, they were dead wrong. But to, to continue to shoot, Pastor Dennis and I saw a raw footage where his body on the ground was just jumping, mm -hmm. just jumping. He's down and just his body just jumping, being riveted by bullets. That was a, that was a, a, a watered down, a soft uh, video that the media saw. We saw the raw footage officers just cussing him, you know, get the wow. F out the car. Wow. And, and they were close enough then. That's when you would think that he would have been a threat, but they were acting courageous. And then when he got a, when he started running, then all of a sudden they're fearful. They're fearful. They're, He's a threat now. That doesn't make Running any sense. Running away, <laughs> he, he became a threat and needed to be shot 60 times. So 
those things we cannot sidestep. We can't get around them. And it, and it's true. I mean, if any, you can ask a, a, a six year old uh, child playing on the playground that you hear about that guy that shot him, and he'll say, "Yeah, they shot him sixty times." You know, because it's out there. It's out. It's that's that Goliath that's showing up, and and uh, we got to do something about it. Real quick, who was the who was the FOP that you spoke of that came out justified this? Who, who that was that? in the Beacon Journal. That's the Fraternal Order of Police declared that after the BCI investigation, and that's their their uh, uh, president. He said, "You'll find out that the officer's shooting is justified." Mm. So he's pointing to something in their procedure right. that says, "When you're in a situation like this." That can be the appropriate response. This shoot, mm-hmm. and uh, but see, there's no there 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 becomes a common sense mindset because there is not one inkling of de escalated mindset in that at that point at that point you got eight officers man how just let him run he's gonna stop right he's gonna get tired and stop but. But yet, and still, again, my contrast in, in in Illinois, this guy can take off running. When they caught up with him, he had his dress on. Pastor Dennis said he went up up there with the dress on, up on top of the roof. And he ran, and they caught him and handcuffed him. And they always say, we want to find out the motive. But we we don't last long enough to find them. For the opportunity, we do. Right. So you know, John. Somebody asked me this question, and maybe we can all answer it. They said, "Do you know any white man that's been shot sixty times by the police?" I don't know a white a white man that's been <laughs> shot ten times. <laughs> I mean, really, I, I was asked that question. Mm-hmm. I, I I you know I don't know if you know Pastor Glenn. No, no, it's unheard of. Yeah. It's unheard of. That's the first we 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 heard. It's been. It's been worse enough for African Americans unarmed to be shot once mm-hmm. by the police. Right. But now we've escalated to 60 rounds. And he was unarmed and running away. John, you know what's interesting? We're sitting here talking, and you can feel our pain too. Absolutely. We're still trying to make sense of this. And we have people who are looking to us to help them make sense of this. And, and this is why um, this, this context and this setting is so good. Because we need to talk it through. Mm-hmm. And that takes time. Right. It takes time to talk it through. And that's why it was important for me to have y'all here. Again, you guys are elders. You know, you've experienced this world the way it is today much longer than what I have. And like Dr. John said on numerous times, this isn't the first, and it's not going to be the last. You, you, you know. Um, so when we when we commute like this together, you know, there is a level of healing that that can be done. You know, John, he was hit sixty times, and he was still handcuffed when he got to the corn. Right. He had to ask for the who has the keys. That's the dehuman dehumanization that comes with it, right? Like that again, that wouldn't have happened to a dog. Yeah. Oh, it's still there's still been picketing. You you kill an uh, animal like that. That's right. Yeah. Why did you have to shoot the dog sixty times? They don't. That doesn't happen like that. It, it don't it don't work like that. Listen, gentlemen, I appreciate your time. I appreciate, you, um, I, I appreciate your service. Um, I appreciate your leadership and your, and your guidance, um, and I need y'all to take care of yourselves. Yeah. <laughs> I need y'all to unplug from this some way, somehow. One less cookie for me, right? Listen, <laughs> un- unplug from the internet, unplug from the news. Right. You know, un- unplug at times. You know, allow. You, I hope you guys are um, allowing yourself to feel what you are feeling. You know, um, and, and, and take care of yourself. That's my wish um, as as a young person. You know, for 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 our elders in our community, the, the leaders. Um, specifically, so I appreciate your service, appreciate your time, and thank y'all for coming. Another episode, LYP. Peace. <laughs> <laughs>